In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Our Chaplain's Report today, we're actually going to be foregoing our usual series on the book of Samuel. Uh, we'll be rejoining that shortly. But I'm going to do something very unusual for the Chaplain's Report, something I do not normally do, but I feel that it's imperative. Now, normally the Chaplain's Report is free from recent news. I, I don't plug it into what's going on in the world, at least in the sense that I, I don't like put it together with a news story intentionally. I keep it at least somewhat separate, and it's basically just a Bible lesson. I'm going to add something in here because it's incredibly timely and there is a biblical message in it. It's a clip, and it's a little long, but believe me, it's worth it, from Bernice King. She is the daughter of Martin Luther King Jr., and the words that she's saying, I think that we could all stand to try to digest and, and take to heart here for a moment. I have to make an appeal to my brothers and sisters because I realize that the only way to get constructive change is through nonviolent means. You know, a lot of people have been using my father's words. Sometimes I get a little upset when people do that and co-opt those words and take them out of context. But I realize that he gave his life to this nation. He was a son of this state and of this city, born on the soils of this city, on Auburn Avenue. But he said to us, riots are the language of the unheard. And the part we often miss when people use it is the part about the unheard. This is a time when we all have to listen. We have to listen to the cries that are coming out of the hearts and the souls of my young brothers and sisters and all of the others that are in the streets of America right now and in our city. But if there's anything I can say to them as they cry out to look at these changes because the changes have to happen. We can't go back to yesterday. We can't keep doing things like we've been doing it in this nation, we've got to deal with systemic racism and white supremacy once and for all. But the only pathway I know to do this is through nonviolent means. It is a proven method. It did not fail my father and them. As many people who think it failed, it did not fail them because one thing about it is when you really understand it and really practice it, it brings about the results. So right now it's about what is the end goal? The end goal is we want change and we want it now. But change never comes through violence. It is not a solution. Violence in fact creates more problems. It is not a solution. Nonviolent way is the way because the means and the ends have to be consistent. We will never get to the end of justice and equity and true peace, which is not merely the absence of tension, but the presence of justice, unless we do it through nonviolent means. Why is that so different? Why is what we just saw so incredibly different? And what is so contrasted between the history that we know about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his movement to what we're seeing today? Now, the obvious answer is that one was violent and one wasn't, but that's the surface answer. Let's dig down deep into it. Because what she's saying is 100% right. That relying on violence, it may cause change, but it's not going to be change that you want. It only makes things worse. The reason that her father's movement was able to overcome 
all of that in a relatively short amount of time, really only about a decade. And the reason they were able to accomplish such massive change in such a short amount of time was because they were committed to nonviolence. I mean, if you've seen old footage, and it is a crying shame that so many people of my generation have not, if you have seen old footage of what has happened in this state, Birmingham, Montgomery, Selma, when you look at that and you see what happens, and you're watching them and they're like, you're like, they're having, you know, dogs turned on them and, and having people attack. They're not even fighting back. Even at times where they were actually confronted with real violence. And they still refused to fight back. That's what changed people's minds. Acting like a thug, that doesn't change anybody. Going out and being a criminal and destroying other people, destroying their property, I mean, they, they believe that they even wound up killing a guy in, I believe it's, it's Austin, Texas. That doesn't change anybody's mind. And for the people that already might have had bias, that only confirms to them that you were what they always thought that you may have been. If you want to change a heart and a mind, you do it through nonviolence. That's what Dr. King believed. That's what he dedicated his life to. Unfortunately, it's the message that he eventually wound up dying for. But here's the thing we have to all keep in mind. The reason that it's so different, what is that deep answer underneath the surface level of just, well, one's nonviolent, one isn't? Why was one nonviolent? Because it was rooted in truth. It was rooted in the gospel. The reason that the protesters turned rioters, the reason that you're seeing the level of looting and chaos and villainy and anarchy that we have seen over the past week, the reason that that has happened in that movement, but it never happened in Dr. King's movement, is because everybody knew what they stood for and they had that common bond of being brothers and sisters in Christ. And all they wanted, their stated goal, was not vengeance, but reconciliation. They understood, fundamentally, that if they wanted to be able to get that equality that they so desperately and righteously sought out, that they would have to do so on the basis of Jesus Christ. Why? Because otherwise... The only allegiance that you have, the only thing that can make your life even somewhat meaningful, is your tribe. Tribalism is a cancer that has plagued the human race practically since its existence. You can see all throughout the Old Testament, what were their tribes based on? What were their gods that they worshipped? What are the idols that they bowed down to? It, were, it was primarily gods that lived in their mind in their tribe and favored their tribe. They had tribal gods. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was a universal God, a non-tribal God, one that had, yes, a special relationship with Israel, but he was the God of everybody. This was true in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. It's, it's in every single story, practically. This idea that there is a God that created all, and thus all men, at least in some sense, are brothers and sisters. If you want to break people out of the mindset that something as trivial as your skin tone is what defines you as a person and break somebody out of the, the idea that their tribe is what's really important and that we should all get together and that we should all be equal, then you have to start with that. You have to start with a common kinship of humanity. The problem with this and the reason that you've seen looting and all kinds of, of violence and property destruction and people getting hurt and assaulted, so on and so forth, is because they see those people as less than people. They see those people, whether it's because of the color of their skin or, or because they're you know members of Antifa and they see everybody that isn't a socialist as a member of not their tribe. They see those people as less than them because they are tribalist at heart. If you are a Christian at heart, 
it is impossible to believe that your tribe is better than every other tribe because you see everybody as part of your tribe, or at the very least a potential member. If you're looking at it in terms of save and lost, if you're looking at it in terms of Christianity in the world, you may see your tribe as at the very least blessed and better off, but you don't see yourself as superior to them because you understand that you needed salvation just as much as they do. You understand that the God that created you also created them. And you have a theology that teaches you that the kind of person that is going to be saved, that is allowed to have fellowship with his God eternally, is one that treats his brother the way that he wants to be treated. That treats his brother the way that he would treat Christ. That he sees his Savior in everyone. He sees everyone as an image bearer of an almighty creator. You don't start with that. You can't even get off the ground. And I think that we need to understand that especially in the light of what we have so recently seen, especially in the light of what we have just witnessed and telling people from on high in pillars of power as a government, you're not allowed to go to church. Church is a non-essential function. Did we really expect anything else? If a society is comfortable in telling its citizens that church really doesn't matter and you don't really have to do it, and by the way, we can just kind of take that away from you anytime we want to, to a society that is so incredibly flippant about that, is it really any surprise that it could birth a movement as violent and evil as this one? Because I don't think so. I mean, heck, even very good and, and godly nations occasionally spur something like this. When we have reached that level of depravity, it comes as no surprise to me. When we have so forsaken God that we can write it off as literally non-essential that we go and worship Him, then I genuinely can't think of, of any different outcome. When you start with that, what, what Bernice King was just talking about, the reason that her father's movement was different is because everybody had to sign a non-aggression pledge. And part of that pledge was to read the scriptures daily, reflect on them. Another part of that pledge was to remember that we were seeking reconciliation and not vengeance. That's a message that is rooted in Scripture. Treating everybody equally the call to equality is something that really only makes sense if you believe in a single universal God. It doesn't make sense any other way. Why shouldn't one tribe take advantage of another? unless you have a people that are rooted in that fundamental truth, equality is impossible. Reconciliation is impossible. Bloody tribal wars are the only result of such a people. And if we do want to get to exactly what she was talking about, nonviolence is the only approach that can be taken to reach that goal. You can't get to peace and nonviolence through violence. It just doesn't work that way. Never has, never will. There is a peace that can sometimes be found only on the other side of war. But within a nation, within a movement, you can't get there through violent means. It doesn't work that way. All it does is breed more fear and resentment, which eventually leads to more violence. And so, what she's saying is, is 100% correct. You can only... What we have seen transpire over the past week is the natural, logical conclusion to a godless society. And I'm ashamed to say that here in America, we are quickly moving towards that. Granted, this time, it was relatively small compared to the whole. But unless we start believing that all lives matter, 
that every single life is precious to God, and it is precious specifically because it was God that made it and created it in His image, we're simply not going to be able to get to a place where peace exists. Stay the course, friends. My mother always said if you can't say something nice about somebody, then you're probably talking about a leftist. Nah, I kid, but seriously, it would really help me out if you would like this video and subscribe to my channel. I'm sure my mom would appreciate it.